Okay, let's get, let's get back to flint napping videos, at least for a little bit. I was looking around, I'm putting away a lot of my stuff, and I found this this piece here, along with these other pieces, um, like a dummy. I forgot to label this rock, so I forget who it's from or what it is. Uh, this does not smell like oil. Right, so. Well, we'll see. And I'll break into it. This is Onondaga, right? That's what I thought this was. But there's some, there's some differences. This, is, this looks more porous. And I think this has an oily smell to it when you break it open. But this stuff, I'm not sure. Let's, let's try it out. Yeah, I'm probably going to crack this thing in half. Well, let's see. I'm a little bit rusty. Getting sidetracked with the, the auctions and then the... Billet napping. We'll get back to glass here in a little while. Back to napping some glass. But before I put this away and never see it again, if one of you recognizes it, forgive me, but I forgot who it was from. You can just tell me, hey, it's from me, in the comments or whatever. I hate to take a guess. I mean, I'm pretty sure I know where this is from or who I, who sent it to me. But I don't want to take a guess and be wrong. That's what I get for not immediately doing these little rock challenges. Why am I not using antler on this? Because it's a mystery stone. I don't want to mess up my antler. I don't want to crack my beautiful Axis antler billet. Because I do hit the stone pretty hard. And I'm back to gouging with... This is a small billet. I call it a billet. I'm back to gouging and not swiping with this one. For those of you who are just tuning in, gouging is hitting with a small surface area, usually a rounded billet. And just gouging out, almost like a chisel gouges out, or a gouge gouges out wood, you know what I'm saying? This will gouge out flakes from your workpiece, whereas if you're using a flat-ended billet like this, you're basically swiping them off. It swipes, it doesn't catch right away, it, it slides, and then with the pressure inward, and the force downward, it removes a flake while it's on the slide. This one just digs right in and just peels it off like uh, a gouging action. That's why I say it's a gouging type billet or technique. All right, let's see if I can remove some of this mass and get rid of that turtle back. It's risky. I don't know what's going on with this side. risky because it could just snap right in half let's see there's just a good platform there i want to see if i can take off that mess yeah it's got some it's got some inconsistencies nice here but then it gets kind of bumpy
crystals right there on that side. This could end up a little almond size preform. Where's my big braider? There it is. I missed this one. Come on, come on. You can do it. There it is. Yeah, that's that's some dicey stuff there. I'm gonna have to lose more length and width to try to level that out. I'm gonna take off this mass here. For those of you who think this is nice a nice chunk of chert that's easy to nap, you must you must be a newbie. I wish I had some of that really easy to nap chert that he's got. Yeah. I wish I had some of that nice easy to nap chert too. Because this ain't it. Okay. Alright, let's see. Yeah, I miss the old technique. But I think the swiping technique has a lot of potential to uh, be able to remove long, thin flakes without stressing the workpiece very much. And then we can get into some really thin, good width to thickness ratio type blades, larger pieces with uh, very good ratios instead of just the small pieces that I usually make. This gouging technique, it does the it does the job, but it, it's very very aggressive and very stressful on the material. So to get a very thin and wide workpiece is difficult with this technique, if not impossible, just because of the physics of it. Even if you're extremely talented, it's difficult to get something thin out of it. I'm not going for so, I'm not going for thinness on this one. I just want to make something out of it. Come on, there's something preventing it from going. Hit that one twice. I didn't realize it had released the first time. Why am I not using indirect percussion? Because I'm still having fun with it with the direct percussion right now. I don't see, I mean, it's not all that risky yet. I can still probably thin it down more with the billet if I can just get past those weird areas now would it be better if I isolate maybe but see I'm hitting a wall there there it goes Oops, I hit the tip. I'm trying to hit this step fracture right there. It's getting smaller. But I need big platforms to really get into this stone and take those turtle backs off. I need some very stout, very 
pronounced areas to hit. Okay, here goes. Moment of truth on this one. Still, I don't know how I'm going to get through that stuff on that side. We'll see. It feels like it's got a crack in it. Where is it? There it is. Alrighty. Youch. Got some issues for sure. It looks like a fossil. Probably three fossils right there. I don't see any other ones. Well, there might be like remnants of the original organisms or whatever that uh, don't look like anything but they are fossils all right let's see if I can remove that big mass no it didn't go too far hmm All right, that one was better. All right, here goes. It's dicey because I see a crack there, but I'm gonna try to hit that side of the turtle back, see what happens. I felt something. Something let loose somewhere. Yeah, I'm really, really winding up to hit that. Let's see. Interesting stuff, but I don't think I'd be able to get something thin out of it. Could I have hit it with indirect percussion and saved it? Maybe. But I want it to be able to stand up to strikes like that. Because if it can, then it will be much easier to make a thin piece out of it. But if it's going to be that dicey, because there's a seam on that side... It's going to be that dicey. It's not worth it trying to stay thin. I mean, try to try to get it thin. It won't stay thin. All right. So there are some flakes here I can make stuff out of. I mean, these two pieces maybe. I don't know. I don't like this particular. chunk that I just broke in half these look a little bit better these flakes here all right Can't find my trusty old 
steel. There it is. Okay, let's see what we can do with this little flake. It's not too bad, actually. I've napped worse. And I'm fixing the, I'm getting ready to nap something that's worse. If I can find the, the box that was just shipped to me the other day with some rhyolite. It's got some rhyolite in it and uh, very tough. The kind of stuff you make railroad gravel out of. We'll see how it works. Uh, railroad gravel is the stuff you put underneath the railroad track. That's what I call it. Uh, sometimes you can actually find flint or chert in the railroad gravel. It's rare, but sometimes you can, depending on where they're getting it from, where they're getting the gravel from. If it's a, if it's a limestone quarry, and they're grinding up stuff that's got chert or flint in it for gravel. That's where you'll find the chert and flint. Um, you'll find it in that sort of railroad gravel. It's going to be small pieces, probably no bigger than this, but you can still nap it. Of course, everyone nowadays wants seven inch long blades are better. That's, that's now considered specialty stone that you have to buy this at a premium. Anything larger than six inches or seven inches is premium stone. That's nappable anyway. Nappable and not heat treated. Now you can find Novaculite in, in Burlington of that size heat treated. It's not not rare but I guess people don't want that they want flint real flint preferably fancy color in large pieces yeah me too I want that too but I don't, that's out of my price range for now. Okay. Of course, it's free if you got property that has some of that on the property. But that's just luck of the draw these days. Uh, there will come a time where people will invest in land simply for the flint. But flint has not gotten that expensive. Not yet. It will eventually. Yeah, so this this type of stone does not want to be struck hard enough to remove these long flakes. It will crush at the point of impact with the force required to remove a long flake it will crush you know you get used to how, what will generate a long flake right you get used to the force and you try to pr try to prepare a platform as stout as you can and you know what it takes to get that long flake because you've been napping on the material for at least a little bit at least a few minutes like I have so yeah I know how much force I need now for a flake to go past halfway and the stone will
will just crush in the beginning and it will not go anywhere for the most part unless I get a lucky hit and uh, lucky in the sense that it actually peels a flake off yeah like that now can I duplicate that platform every single time that's what I'm trying to do but it's it's natural stone so you, you really can't be too perfect about it you can try but then you're going to be spending all of your time setting up platforms I suppose that's okay but I don't particularly enjoy napping if it starts to take that route where I'm just setting up platforms and the striking and the shaping and the making of the point becomes secondary uh, because then it becomes trivial after you thin it down if you're just creating platforms so that you can drive flakes to thin it down what most guys do is is just trim around the edges and put notches in it and it's done after it's thinned down with those very methodical strikes on platforms that take forever to prepare Yeah, the only thing I can probably make out of this is a Lavana point. I think this rock is from the northeast. It's funny how that works. Now, how does this how does this work with antler? Does it antler nap this better? No. It does not nap it better. It might look a little prettier. But as far as getting into it and actually removing big flakes with antler on this kind of stuff, it's just miserable. Especially on your antler. Your antler is going to hit you. I always say that, right? I always say that it's not really a good idea to use antler on material that is going to eat it up because you might be saying that's just the nature of the game you know so what well i just don't enjoy it i don't enjoy that type of napping where i'm just consuming consuming my tools quickly and uh, it becomes, the hobby becomes a tool maintenance, uh, aggressive attack on a stone type of endeavor. With a lot of stuff, you go through a lot of stone because it's hard to make stuff out of, and you go through a lot of tools, a lot of time not really doing anything except just hammering on the stone. Once in a while, you have. A lucky easier to nap piece than average and then call that a hobby I don't know not for me not for me anyway Some guys think that's what we do, I guess. Uh, that's a, another aspect. I don't know how you guys do it, but you're always so patient beating on those rocks. I can't imagine just sitting there beating on rocks all day. Well, that's because we don't really beat on rocks all day. If we can help it, a lot of it hopefully is shaping doing some research on what you want to make and then maybe make a duplicate of one of your favorite points from the archaeological record without struggling the whole way struggle is okay I guess challenge is okay but uh, 
most of the time, at least for me, I'm not I am not napping in a posture of torture. I don't know how to say it. I don't feel like I'm torturing myself every minute. I, you know, eventually you want to get over that aspect. In the beginning, you're going to do it. You can't avoid it. You're going to tor you're going to be tortured in the beginning. After a while, you want to be able to get to the point where it's second nature you can think of other things it's not a constant battle and uh, it becomes a, a hobby that releases maybe some tension or anxiety and gives you some satisfaction okay Yeah, it's pretty predictable that this is what's going to happen to this kind of stone. I'm not really putting all that much pressure on it, and it is breaking above the platforms. You, you, that's, what, that's how you know you've got a crumbly type of stone. When you push on the platform, and it breaks above it, uh, but not in a semicircular way. It's just straight across or some other way you know you got some crumbly stone it'll still produce a sharp edge it'll still uh, give you hunting points if that's what you are into you can certainly make hunting points out of very difficult stone but a lot of times you can predict the outcome by the consistency of the stone and as you get better you can make really nice things out of it once you get used to it and it's all, all its quirkiness and whatever this is mainly for the new guys you old old nappers already know this sometimes new people don't really understand That it's the stone that acts really funny. It's not really your napping skill necessarily. That's why I recommend good stone to learn on. Because the the way this flakes, uh, you might you might think that uh, okay now I'm getting used to how stone flakes in general. No, it's with this type of stuff. This flakes in a specific way. The guys that tell you to, to learn on tough stone, uh, if you have tough stone that naps in a common way, then fine. But this, like this, this piece and this stuff here, this does not nap in a common way. So you have to have a particular type of skill for this if you want to make good points from it. This is a very uh, odd type of stone. All right, you're not going to get experience working most stones by beating your head against this for long periods of time weeks months or years and then say okay now i can nap anything if i can nap this stuff no you've developed a special skill set just for this stone you're going to go to other stone you're going to say what happened why why am i not able to get any results with this other stone or maybe you are going to get results but you'll say you know what this other stone that I'm working now was is totally different than the stone I started from or started with. And I, I had a learning curve and it uh, messed with me for a little while and I messed up some good expensive stone that I was saving after I thought that after napping terrible stone, I could nap it and my expense would be worth it. But no. I ended up messing up good stone because of the learning curve from the bad stuff. The bad stuff just 
wasn't anything like the good stuff. All right. So, yeah, let me just finish this out. It's going to be a Lavana or a Madison. Very easy point to make. And then I'll call it good. I'm out of time. So I'm just going to sharpen the edge. Uh, let me just continue on the next one since I'm out of time on this segment. Okay. All right, let's see if I can finish this up quickly. Yeah, if you're if if this is the kind of stone that you have, and this is the only thing you have, and you and you're thinking that you can become good at any other type of stone as long as you beat your head up against this long enough and say, if I can conquer this nasty stuff, I can conquer anything. Uh, you may be in for a, a shock. And you'll be emailing me saying, this is my first attempt at really nice stone after five years of bad stone. I don't know why I can't get this good stone to work. It looks like an almond or it looks like a charcoal briquette. What happened? I mean, what am I missing? Am I missing something obvious? Why, yes, you are. You are practicing on something that did not translate to what you're doing now. Simple as that. Okay. You gotta be careful around barbs with this stuff because it will just wipe out delicate areas. It'll take the path of least resistance and wipe that wipe out a barb or even the edge. Because it's kind of crumbly and it it'll do that too. Alright. Some real artifacts actually have those left in those little bites taken out of the sides the nappers they don't bother fixing those because it would require removing too much of the width and yeah I am a little bit rusty after taking a break from napping and yeah I don't mind messing this type of stone up uh, but I think a lot of you guys are, are very anxious to see how I do with this kind of stone. See what can be done with it. And I understand that part, but I won't be able to do anything nice with it until I get used to it. Which requires, you know, more than just, what was that, three pounds of stone? It's more like 30 pounds would be get you know barely getting used to it maybe I can make something nice and thin out of it there is usually a, a learning curve with every kind of stone there are families of stone that nap very similar to each other many of the true flints are very similar to each other far as nappability but you get into this other stuff like I don't I don't know what this is called it's not an oil chert doesn't it does not smell like oil it's, uh, it's a very crumbly kind of dry it is sharp and it is flakeable so you know I think it would be a chert but it also could be some kind of volcanic material, which will not be a chert. So I don't know. Like a fine-grained basalt 
it maps well, but it's not a chert. It's a volcanic material. This might be some sort of basalt type or volcanic stone. I don't know. Hopefully the guy... Hopefully, if you sent this to me, <laughs> you'll be able to recognize it. Yeah, that's more like a Madison now. It's, it's getting tinier. I can't seem to press off big flakes with the pressure flaker without biting into it like this here. I want to be able to thin down the edge, but it seems to bring a lot of the edge with it when you try to press off a flake. It takes a lot of the edge off with it, with the flake. See that? You can get a good flake, but then you lose a lot of the edge. Uh, I think that might be the basis for serrations on some points, where the, the original napper back in the day was just trying to get long flakes, and you said, you know what? I kind of like the serrated look to it, so I'm going to use that to my advantage and just put serrations in at the same time I'm trying to get long flakes to the center. Because I know if I try it to have a nice smooth fancy edge, I'm not going to be able to push hard enough to get those flakes to travel. And if I do, I'm going to have to go back and make it look pretty. But if I put in some heavy serrations or hit or you know press real hard against the edge and then call them heavy serrations and say yep I meant to do that it might work better in the long run I'm trying to get that point thin and narrow, but it's not cooperating. Okay, let's see. Usually I can push off a few good flakes and make it thin, but this is not cooperating. Not too bad. Yeah, so I'm just going to leave those intense pressure flaked platforms or the, not the platforms, but the digs on the side when you try to push off a, a really big flake, it digs into the side. I'm just going to leave them that way and call them serrations. I want to try to thin it down a little bit in the middle so it doesn't look so thick. But I think I'm going to call it good. There's nothing wrong with a point like this, either for an atlatl dart point or an arrow. This is an atlatl dart four shaft, uh, standard size, typical dart, yeah, seven sixteenths. So it's a pretty thick arrowhead. If it's a true arrowhead, which it could be. It's the same size as a true arrow point, but you, it's very difficult to get it as thin as a, a high quality chert. But you can mount it on an arrow shaft, on arrow four shaft. An arrow shaft or an arrow four shaft. So it would be 
a Madison at this size. A Lavana would be larger, typically. But yeah, it's nice and sharp. Very jaggedy, which is fine. But just to avoid the hassle, I would I would not try to get any fancier than this. The barbs are not symmetrical. You know, this one is is not as long as it as this one. But it doesn't matter if you're hunting with it. It doesn't matter. Symmetry doesn't really play a big role in the function of the arrowhead it's the sharpness and the, the hafting quality you know smooth transition between the wood and the stone uh, when you spin the foreshaft or regular shaft whichever you attach this to when you spin it it should be centered so as to not deviate from the pathway that you're projectile is traveling you know if it's if it's not centered correctly if the point's not centered correctly as it enters a wound it'll it'll kind of do this thing like if it's skewed you don't want that to happen because it'll turn right it loses energy if it turns you want to preserve as much energy as possible so that you can get a pass through if you can all the way through so you have to minimize the resistance one of the things that resists penetration is a point that's not centered properly like when you, you spin it on its axis when you spin the shaft or the foreshaft along the center axis make sure that point is lined up so when you spin it like this Stay stationary. I can't get it to to seat. So you get the idea. That point needs to be stationary when you spin it. I'm all shaky. Anyway, it'll work. I wouldn't try to get any fancier than that. You can. I've seen fancy arrowheads, especially in California, where they were using material this bad and and uh, achieving some delicate thin points with it that's fine but it, it just it would take a lot of practice okay but this will help me get back in the groove and uh, get back into some napping after showing those artifacts and uh, doing the auction. Another auction is coming up today. But I'll be trying to mix napping in uh, rock challenges and stuff in between auctions and in between doing the artifact showing. Alright, that's it.